Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron have called for a worldwide truce during the Paris Olympic Games. President Xi Jinping also said China and France should uphold independence and jointly prevent a new Cold War or block confrontation. So what are the outcomes of President Xi's visit to France and what's the strategic significance of the visit amid rising tensions around the world? And we also explore centuries of cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges between the two nations. Join us for our live discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Professor John Gong with University of International Business and Economics and Professor Joe Toker with American Graduate School in Paris. Uh, so I'll start with you, John. Of course, you know, this is a two-day visit, the third visit of um, President Xi Jinping to uh, France there. What's your takeaway? Well, I think uh, um, I would first point to the fact that both sides issued a joint statement. And it's a joint statement with a lot of substantial uh, content in it. I think this uh, speaks volume about uh, the achievements we have achieved so far. Um, and I think you know, what, what strikes me most is that um, um, you know, both sides are calling for a Olympic truce time uh, during the uh, Paris Summer Olympics. And I think this is a, a major, major achievement in my view, because we all understand very well that uh, the Ukraine conflict holds a you know, substantial weight on the part of the, the French side. And, and I think um, this is probably something that they would be asking, and, and we essentially uh, you know, promise what they're asking for. And I think that's a, it's a huge achievement from, from Paris' perspective. And a couple of other you know, major uh, cooperation results, uh, as uh, you know, we witnessed the signing of agreements, 18 of them together, right in front of the two leaders at the time. Quite a few, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And also, I think um, you know, the European side, you know, at the round table uh, summit, where you have um, President Xi, you have Macron, you have uh, Van der Leyen, uh, the European uh, Commission president, you know, uh, she talked about, you know, basically, I mean, the, the European side is, is makes it very clear that uh, we don't agree with this uh, decoupling. Uh, right. I think this is the indication of like the differences you see, right. European policy on China or American policy on China. That's not. I, I think uh, there's a there's a major departure from what Anthony Blinken said when he was in China. Or well, actually, before he visited China you know, a few days ago, basically he said that China cannot have this, the, the both sides of the world while maintaining the normal trade relationship with Russia, while at the same time getting improvements with the relationship with with, with European Union. And and I think President Xi's visit is a resounding rebuttal of that narrative. No, it's it's not like that. China still maintains a normal trade relationship with Russia, but at the same time we're actually improving relationship with Paris. So uh, you know. Paris being a major uh, uh, a member of the European Union state, uh, U U European Union, and you know, clearly, I think uh, what uh, Anthony Blinken said is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know, uh, presidency has repeatedly hailed the China-France ties as. Uh, you know, being at the forefront of China's relations with Western countries. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you understand, how do you interpret uh, presidency's stress of this kind of like uniqueness in, yeah. in the China's relationship well, with Western powers? Yeah, well, I think it, the history between China and France goes back hundreds of years, actually, right? Um, you know, I would point to the, remember in 2019, if I remember this correctly, when President Xi visited France, um, President Macron presented him a French version of the Confucius, a collection of Confucius works, right? You know, this happened in the 1600, I think, right? This, you know, so the history goes back many years. Um, and I think re the relationship between China and France represents probably the first wave of interactions between East and West, between China and Europe. And later on, you know, this tradition continues. Um, you know, President Xi talked about this during the talk yesterday, an open speech, he mentioned that Naval College or, or construction yard in, in Fuzhou at the time, right? And he was mentioning this, I and mean, he, he probably knows this very well because he used to be the, essentially the governor of Fujian province, right? <laughs> Tell us more about that. You know, um, many people were surprised uh, when they visited that place. You know, they saw a French face among the Chinese, uh, yeah. uh, you know, heroes at that time right. being remembered, of course. Uh -huh. People would wonder you know, what happened, who is this guy? Yeah. You know, so, and, you so, know, so how that, that was in 1866, uh, if I remember that correctly, a French um, naval officer was hired by the 
uh, central government at the time in the Qing Dynasty at the time to help build a shipyard, basically, right? To build um, warships, uh, steel warships at the time. It was cutting edge technology at the time, you know, 1866. Uh, in addition to this, it also served as a, um, a training college, basically, for naval officers. And I, I, and I would even argue that uh, the Qing Dynasty's naval um, forces, the Navy itself, was born on that day, I would say, when, when this uh, factory, this plant was established and the, the Naval College was established at the time. So, you know, France really helped China, you know, at that time. And later on, you know, we all remember that uh, starting from, I think, 1806, when the you know, wave of Chinese students went to France. Uh, work and study. Work and study program in French, it's called a movement, travail, uh, estude. estude. Yeah, so it's the, it's the movement of Chinese students going to France, um, you know, getting exposed to the uh, modern education, uh, science and technology. And also I want to point out, it was during that movement when the Chinese Communist Party was born at the time, right? I mean, one of the eight branches, of the oldest branches of the Chinese Communist Party was born in Paris. Uh, leaders like Zhou Enlai and Xiaoping, they were all part of that movement at the time, you know? So I think it it's actually um, means a lot uh, for, for China, looking well, back. What's the, what's the background, you know, why uh, there were so many young Chinese went to France during that particular period of time? Well, I mean, 19th century and early 20th century, Paris is is the epicenter of the uh, you know these uh, leftist uh, uh, thoughts and and, and, and schools uh, during the in during those days. It's like you know, um, like in the 1930s, they all go to the United States. You know, at that time, they all go to Paris <laughs> to to study the latest uh, developments in science and technology, the the latest in um, uh, humanities, latest in social science. So it's, it's a it's an epicenter uh, of the well, global uh, political activities at the time, and you know, a lot of uh, new theory was, was born. Um, you know, the communism was born essentially over there. Um, Anarchism was also born there, right? So you know, it was a it was a place full of a lot of you know thoughts, uh, political thoughts at the time, and also represents the cutting edge of science and technology. So it's no wonder that uh, many uh, Chinese students went there. At the highest, I think it was about like two thousand students went to. Uh, of France at the time, so it was a it's a big big uh, movement, and, and uh, certainly it it cast a profound impact on on the modern China, on on the birth of the People's Republic of China. Yeah, several years later, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, and, you know, coming back to the current um, relationship between China and France, uh, you know, one Eastern a big power in the East, uh, you know, a big power in the West. Uh, of course, you know, uh, the relationship is being developed, it's being pursued by two countries against a background, as mm -hmm. I said earlier. Uh, you know, tensions uh, like mm -hmm. in Ukraine, in the Middle East, uh, of course, in other places of the world, and also the U.S., uh, right. so-called competition, strategic right. competition with China. Um, so, you know, President Xi basically uh, stressed the point that, um, you know, hopefully we can continue with this uh, spirit of being independent or mm -hmm. independence and work together to prevent a new Cold War or so-called confrontation between different blocs. In that respect, I mean, how do you see this importance probably of this relationship? Yeah, so what you said is very characteristic of the, you know, the Gaullist uh, political uh, penchant of the France uh, country. Um, and, and it goes back many years when France was independent after the Second World War. So um, looking 64, right? The yeah, right. And, and France is also the first country in the, among the Western bloc to start to establish diplomatic relationship with China uh, in, in, in 1960s. Um, and, and this represents a major, major step um, you know, between China and, and the Western world. And I think in this sense, you know, it, it shows the tradition of uh, France carrying out a independent and sovereign uh, 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 diplomacy, uh, diplomatic policy. So, so I think you know, this is very significant. We have to point out that uh, France and China um, are both well, United Nations permanent security member states, uh, and France is the only member state in within the European Union. So I think you know both China and France have a lot of things in common in terms of carrying out the independent, sovereign diplomatic policies, uh, foreign policies. So um, so I think in that sense, the cooperation between the two sides, um, you know, means a lot to the rest of the world. 
you know, it means a lot to the global peace uh, and stability. Uh, from that perspective, I would say. Yeah, um, <laughs> avoiding, let's say, you know, um, the pursuit by some in Washington of a new Cold War against China in that respect. Uh, you mentioned about the autonomy of France and also, I think, of the European Union in a larger sense. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Macron. Uh, last year, when he right. was in China, he talked about the strategic autonomy, right. and this recently, you know, again, he talked about you know Europe could, you know, is not motto, right. things like that. You know, he stresses very much about uh, being independent, being independent, you know, either strategically or you know, <laughs> economic, technologically, mm -hmm. uh, or like a, like a economically probably independent of both. China and the U.S. things absolutely. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, tell us more about that. You know, th this is actually, uh, I would say, another background about mm -hmm. Europe here. Yeah. Well, I I, I would say, um, you know, if, if you look at the President Macron's speech uh, yesterday, and you know, he spent actually a lot of time talking about the Ukraine issue, and I think this is probably one of the most important uh, matter. Uh, coming from Paris' perspective, from from, from their side, um, and uh, um, you know he emphasizes a lot about uh, um, you know what's going on in Ukraine, and and he's hoping that China can uh, play a more proactive role in in terms of uh, mediating a peaceful solution for Ukraine, uh, and I think um, you know China and France have a lot of uh, common interests in that regard. Uh, again, I want to point out that. Uh, um, you know, in, in that joint statement, they both mentioned, advocated for a uh, Olympic truce, and this is a huge matter in my view. Uh, so, uh, so I think you know at least uh, you know there are room of cooperation. Certainly, I think you know uh, Paris and Beijing have different perspectives on this conflict in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine, but at least you know we still have common grounds, and to the extent that we have a joint statement, uh, a very substantive both statement. In yeah, that both are against the war for for, for sure. Uh, we have Professor Toker. Uh, Professor Toker, uh, so uh, you know, please share with us what's your observation. You know, what's the response from public to this uh, very important summit between the two leaders here? Well, it is clear that uh, the summit uh, 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 has has focused over different and thorough efforts to make it a big event. I think that it's true on the Chinese side to the extent of my knowledge regarding what is happening in China, but it is certainly the case in France and actually beyond France in Europe. So I guess there is a Chinese perspective to it, obviously, but I'm just trying to show with you what's the perspective from Europe when mm -hmm. you look at this highly planned itinerary, which uh, 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 is difficult for Europeans to understand on, on, on solid, straightforward grounds. Yeah, but, but, but of course, uh, the Chinese, there's uh, like a total of, uh, I think, you know, 1.5 billion euros uh, Chinese investment in, for example, in Hungary. That's important, probably one of the largest. Of course, you know, there is a point for President Xi Jinping to visit, uh, you know, uh, Hungary. Uh, Serbia may be not a part of the EU, but still, uh, you know, as a country in Europe. So that's a, that's a, that's a tour to Europe, not to the EU. Can I say that? Um, but of course, you know, the, beyond the bilateral relationship, but there's a lot, you know, for China, France, and the European Union to care. You know, Ukraine, the Middle East, uh, Iran, uh, the, the nuclear power, the nuclear deal, you know, reached even uh, years ago. So the, uh, the joint statement, they didn't mention about their concern about uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, you know, they uh, urged the, uh, no unilateral move in that front. I think that they probably referred to the uh, possible offensive operation in Rafah, and also they condemned this uh, settlement, uh, you know, in this uh, in in, in the violation of international law by Israelis. So, what do you make of that? You know, both nations are, you know, China, France, uh, permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, of course, they have concern not only, uh, uh, you know, they have a topic, you know, beyond the bilateral relationship, right? Yeah, both, both are members of the Security Council, both are nuclear powers, and both have high ambitions regarding their role and their participation in world affairs, in the big world affairs, beyond bilateral issues and, and issues related to the common cohesion of the EU, right? The EU is not a one block. There are many uh, uh, gaps in, in different uh, uh, positions of different members. It's not as easy to handle it as, say, 
Washington handles the overall U.S. policy towards China or Russia or the EU for that matter. And I, shall I add, President Macron, who is not a typical politician, who is younger, who comes from a different generation, who has not grown up in uh, European or world diplomacy of the two, three, four recent decades, have high ambitions regarding French role in Europe and French role in the world. So I noticed, for example, this idea of a truce to mm. be declared during the three weeks of the Olympic Games, which, as you know, will start in Paris on July 26. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether I, I, I understand that both China and France are supporting this idea, namely uh, keeping all belligerents all over the place, all over the planet, with no violent actions during those two and a half weeks. Will it pass? I saw that Russia was reacting uh, uh, rather rapidly and, and actually ignoring this idea, but we still have uh, uh, over two months. Is there a chance for, say, it would be excellent if there could be yes. a pause, a truce in Ukraine, in the Middle East, in several places in Africa, uh, that would be, uh, and if it would be due to the initiative that's, of President uh, Xi and Macron, that's in they will enter history. A significant uh, call, I would say. It, it's, well, a, it's in the joint statement. Well, with that, uh, you know, we have to cut uh, off here. Thank you, John and Professor Toker, uh, for your insights and time. Earlier, I spoke to Pascal Lamy, former Director General of the WTO, about China-France relations. Let's take a short break here.